kayaking for me is my big passion. I love tramping and I love climbing and all those other sports, but kayaking just has this X factor and I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, my son Cameron and his friend had been to Mount Aspiring College and they'd done, started doing some whitewater kayaking. And they were home over the summer, so they came and um, said, we're going to take you to Arnie Whenua Waterfall and um, we're going to paddle off it. <laughs> so we did. We'll pick you up at the bottom, Mum. Yeah, I was just hooked immediately. I was 47. Kayaking is an obsession. My best man at my wedding said I married Mary because I wanted to prove to the world I loved women more than kayaking. Um, yeah, I do. Kayaking is kind of like aquatic ballet or multi-dimensional wet chess, I suppose. That's it's kind of what it is. It's, it's just a strange sport and that's why I like it. The whole river goes through a gap about four metres across and um, it's rather sort of turbulent and swirly. So they send down the old guys, a bit like the Eskimos. They send the old Eskimos out in the snow to die. Well, I'm sending the old guy down first on this rapid. And if I die, the rest will portage it. That's how it works. I understand my place in the world. So off I go. <laughs> go down there and tell my children I've died bravely. When I was a kid, I was, I used to be really shy. A big part of me coming out of my shell and, and becoming the person I am today was through being in the outdoors and, and through kayaking and, and through tramping and being around people who made you step outside your comfort zone. It's the fun part. It's probably gonna be a little chilly considering Mount Cook is right there next to me and there's a lot of icebergs in the lake, but we're suited up for the occasion. I, I didn't have a single ounce of knowledge of the, of the river that we were running on the day. And uh, not only that, it was my first glacial run. It's a new river and I'm always going to be a little bit nervous on the new river. New crew, most of who I hadn't paddled with before. But it was more excitement. You're paddling from the bottom of a glacier down to another lake, which is also fed by a glacier. So the water is silty, hard to read, cold, very cold. It keeps you on your toes. It, what looks like deep, fast-moving water, she has a rock just a few millimetres under the surface to hang you up. Kayakers are lucky in that we get to see things from a different perspective. It's one thing tramping down a beautiful valley, but it's a totally different experience being in your kayak and seeing, seeing it from the river's level. You wouldn't believe how much fun it is. Like seriously, until you get out there, you're like, oh, it looks all right. You get out there, you're like, oh, mind blown, it's so awesome. Uh, and then you'll never give up and you'll find you end up spending all your spare time and money on it. But um, that's a good thing, you know, it's good to have passion in life. It is a real obsession ever since I started. It's just what I do and it's what I love. And every weekend and every summer and every moment I get, I'm doing some kind of kayaking. I don't care what kind, but getting out on the water and, and feeling it under my boat. I'm happy. You're in the outdoors, you're getting all your vitamin D from the sun. Um, you, it's keeping you healthy.
Well, I love challenging myself when I'm when I'm whitewater kayaking, and a lot of that is the is the mental game. Huge part of that for me is the mental game. And sometimes you can look at some pretty tough rapids and and think you've got it on the day, and it's it's not going to be an issue. But other days you kind of either freak out or you kind of need a bit of a kick up the ass to get down it. I definitely get off on the adrenaline but I love that feeling of getting to the bottom of a rapid, knowing that you've got down, you've done it well and you're pumped. You know, it's a huge rush. Kayakers are motivated by challenge, not by thrill. And there's a big difference between challenge and thrill. If you're kayaking at a high grade stuff at a high level, you need to be doing it all the time. It's much the same as any sport. Um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I got back into whitewater kayaking again, and I didn't really have my nerve. Um, stuff that I had in the past found very easy. It was like bread and butter kayaking. It was hard grade four, and easy five is about as hard as I ever did. And I just used to paddle it all the time, and I never really thought about it. And then I started getting back into that sort of stuff, and it was actually scaring me. I had a lot of self-doubt. There was something in my head that was holding me back. And that bad fear makes you tense and nervous. And if you're tense and nervous, if you think you're gonna screw up, you probably will. And I found myself making stupid mistakes because I was tense and it wasn't fun. So I dialed it back a couple of grades and found where I was completely comfortable and that's what I do. Again. Ooh. <laughs> Given the age of some of the boats in here, I think that sound is entirely appropriate. Um, most of them I actually do paddle all the time. Uh, um, the three reflexes, well, yeah, that's maybe a bit excessive. <laughs> I love my kayak, I hug it so tight I keep it beside me all through the night I blow up its airbags, I smooth its spray skirt I watch out for rocks just so it won't get hurt When I'm in my kayak, I'm in great company I take care of it, it takes care of me I take care of it it takes care of me. My helmet is cracked. My life jacket shot. My paddle's in bad shape. Yeah, so I didn't need all the adrenaline. I realised what I was after was making the move and that I didn't have to paddle grade five to do that. I could, uh, I could do it on grade three. So that gave me two things, one, a, a big reduction in real objective risk in my paddling and a lot more people to paddle with. You've got to face it really, there's a, a lot more people paddling grade three than there are paddling grade five. Take care of it, it takes care of me. Kayak and drifting downstream. All of my troubles, nice. they're only a dream. Got no bills to pay. They, they say there are two types of kayakers those who just swim and those who are just about to. Like every kayaker, I've had more than a few swims in places I'd sooner not have swum. Bumped into rocks, spent time much lower down in the river than I'm happy with. I don't aspire to, to go and run the, the big hairy stuff. I was quite convinced I was going to when I started boating. Quite convinced, sort of, uh, as I uh, came off the kite school course 10 years ago. 
determined that I was going to go and do these things, but um, I haven't. I no longer aspire to do that. I love doing what I'm doing. I get an enormous amount of pleasure out of being on the river, out of sharing that river with other people. I get these days as much pleasure in, in uh, just taking other people down the river. Yes, I'm a kayaker, and I know when I die, I'll find that big river up in the sky where you run every rapid with just a boat scout and once you put in you don't have to take out occasionally at the top of a rapid looking down i might think what on earth am i doing why am i doing this but uh, by the time i get to the bottom of it and i'm looking back upstream i'm thinking i know why i'm doing this it really makes me feel alive it'll take care of me There's an uh, American uh, writer, Lauren Isley, and he once said that if there's magic on this earth, it's found in water. And I agree. I think it's just an incredible place to be. Cross the eddy line a little bit lower, with a little bit more upstream angle. Yeah, feel it start to turn, plant the blade, turn and look downstream. I think one of the biggest things that I'm learning from kayak instruction is kind of about people, how they operate and how much people want to be pushed, and how much you can push them and when enough's enough, trying to figure out a lot about yourself watching other people. I accept that an awful lot of people will never get into kayaking. It's not a mainstream sport. You have to be upside down and not breathing and cold and wet and you get knocked around. But I think everybody, my socialist upbringing, everybody should have an equal opportunity to give it a try. So when we're edging, making sure that we're keeping the body nice and upright and having the edges move underneath us, okay? So, here's a little exercise for you. Hold your paddle out in front of you. Yeah. Whether this is a business or not, I mean, my accountant doesn't think it is. It's a glorified hobby, really. It's a lifestyle. Everybody has to buy into that. End of the season, the body's feeling a little bit broken, but as soon as we get a new group, you get a new, new lease of energy. Try to whip another group into shape. Okay. But I need to go that way. No. I'm confused. Yeah, don't. <laughs> I'm over am I? So just here, all the rest of it. Jeez, you're tense. One, two, three, with me. Okay, where are you looking? Go, <laughs> hand to shoulder. Okay, nice. Looking this way still. Multitasking. <clears throat> Humped. So, for first time in a boat, eh? Yeah, pretty much. No, I'm just really My background in terms of paddling has been a bit of sea kayaking and, and pack rafting. Um, it's something if I go anywhere vaguely remote, anywhere near water, it's something that always finds its way into my backpack. So coming into this course, like this wasn't my step into the kayaking world. This was more trying to find lots of different skills that I could apply to pack rafting and, and being able to read a river better. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so Ben came to us this week as a pretty fresh beginner. Um, he had done quite a bit of pack rafting before, so he had a little bit of whitewater experience, but, um, you know, 30 years old, fit and active, um, keen to learn, and so you can chuck him in the pool and just start throwing the progression at them. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I think it's one of these sports that there's a huge amount of positive people in it because like if you're not positive about it there's plenty of stuff to kind of get scared about and and worry yourself with you're spending time on it you're doing a lot of things which just 
are not normal. So I work in the outdoors, I'm in the forest most days, I'm working with kiwi, um, endangered bird in New Zealand, um, and I do conservation work with them. It's another spectacular part of New Zealand to work in, um, and there is really beautiful rivers around the area surrounding where I live. We're just so lucky in New Zealand with the backyard that we've got. The rivers are all around us and just keen to get out there and get amongst. And, yeah, see what's in the backyard. As a whitewater kayaker, you certainly have the ability to, to get into these places that no one else gets to. Some of these gorges on the west coast are without a doubt the prettiest and most spectacular places that I've been to. Um, have the, followed the principle well known in science, which was discovered in 1947, that water runs downhill. <laughs> and it's all part of the great equation of rocks, air and water. Combined with gradient equals white water, which is actually one of the joyous things on this planet, because it's basically wasted energy, and there's nothing quite like enjoying nature wasting energy. I think my role started dying on me a while ago when I spent some time, I spent three years uh, just doing racing and not doing any white water at all, or almost none, and it's just dogged me ever since, so quite, quite a while now, it's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I'm still technically capable of running grade four, but I don't because my role's not that great and I don't like swimming in grade four. Um, I'm happy enough swimming in grade three, so I still paddle grade three. Okay. Do it again. <laughs> Here in creaking, put it on the water. Push away, away. Just the front end, not the back. I started kayaking largely by accident. Boy Scout camp, Southern Ireland, 70 boys, two double kayaks, and we were allowed to set off across the Shannon River in them, aged 11. Big flood tide, away you went. Maybe you came back. I lived in a, a decaying industrial town in the north of England, which was full of 
very large industrial woolen mills that were all black and made a really loud noise. Clackety, 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 when the looms were all going. And that was your world, apart from holiday trips to the seaside where the whole town, the whole industrial West Riding of Yorkshire decamped en masse. And my parents were, and all their friends were so tired, they just sat on the beach for six days. That's all they did. So they'd sit on the beach and I'd build sandcastles and it obviously wasn't exciting enough. I was probably bored to tears. So is this, is this the local run? Yeah. Local. We come and do almost every afternoon in the spring. Well, I think at that age you have no choice. I mean, you don't consciously decide at that point, gee, I'd like to do this for the rest of my life. But I was the keenest guy in the team for some reason. I used to harass the scoutmaster to get us out there, chase my father up to drive the scout van and on these occasions. I mean, none of them knew what we were doing. They had no idea what happened once we got on the river and disappeared. Well, of course, you're always worried about your own child, but, uh, I mean, we can afford kayaks. We can't afford horses or motorbikes. And I read somewhere, like you do, teenagers are attracted to the activity where they first got their big adrenaline fix. So if they get the first big adrenaline fix kayaking, great. If they get the first big adrenaline fix doing drugs or doing driving, then you have a problem. And society has a problem from that point onwards because they're addicted to their first adrenaline fix. So if you know, whatever you might think about kayaking, it is a healthy, active outdoor sport where you get to meet friends and make teams and Maybe meet the partner of your choice if you're lucky, who knows? But I've got to the point now where I'm ancient, so I'm really super keen. I have a loose formula where if the rescue team are at least uh, less than half my age, I'm probably quite happy. I've been, I'll go out on class five around here, but only because my staff are all 35 years younger than me, and I'm paddling with a very, very fit and experienced rescue team. It's quite a privilege, really. from Ruapehu, down and round the volcanoes to Tarangi. Then unload the bus, but keep your engine running and save your breath. Floats fatten as the driver accelerates, and soon they're all away down the Tongariro River. The hot exhaust gas in contact with the cold water contracts, and the canoes lose pressure. Coming down the rapids at speed, one slightly deflated strikes its softened bows into still water. We had no real training. Um, we did have uh, books on escal rolling. We ran classes later on in the uh, swimming pools in the winter. No, I had no real, real training. No one to train me. <laughs> We'd attend the water disposal sales and buy up all the old uh, flying boat rafts. They'd auction all these things off, uh, and we'd be in attendance there and snap them all up. We saw an ad, the National Airways, as uh, Air New Zealand then was, was selling these surplus dinghies. So we put in a tender and, and we found ourselves the proud owner of a round rubber dinghy, which was a donut with a floor between, so that whatever way it, it landed in the water, you could always climb in. Girls in the club had got together and cut the bottom out of a slit out of the bottom, pulled it into an oval shape so that we could all sit round on the sides 
and paddle. We went off with that, all the white water rapids we could find. The ferry company uh, had all their life jackets on the ferry boats condemned every so often and they'd sell them for next to nothing and we'd snap them all up, which was all very well. We could provide everyone with a life jacket. But after one of the Waikato trips, one of the life jackets fell in the river and sank. <laughs> we graduated from those and we went for 10 years, 12 years, never lost a soul on all our canoeing adventures. So we're quite proud of that. When we decided to build these fold boats, Stella said she wanted her own canoe. Well, so, that tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I built uh, two of them. I ruined one machine on oh. sewing the tops <laughs> to the bottoms of the five-ply bottom of the folding canoes and the canvas tops. This Elner sewing machine, which cost an arm and a leg, was state-of-the-art. It ruined the blooming thing with that. <laughs> It was never the same, never the same ever the again. same again, no. We set up a little factory building, weekenders we called them, they were 11 footers, and you could carry one of these folding canoes on the back of a motorbike, um, which was really mobile. We might have been um, very short of schools or anything, but we enjoyed it at the time. You didn't think ahead, you just enjoyed what you were actually doing at your school level, and you were having a hell of a good time. It was, uh, that's always been... Um... And I don't suppose we ever thought of ourselves as adrenaline junkies. Yes, no. <laughs> about your boy doing this stuff? Um, <laughs> a wee bit nervous We've sometimes. got two others. <laughs> <laughs> over the, the hard stuff and be like, yes, and then just like, on a simple turn, just like, ugh. Can you see the left sweep though? Kind of driving at the eddy. Driving at it, man. Left sweep and then turn the shoulders, part the stroke. That challenger. Hard work, especially for Ben. The other two could make it. Will make it. I have faith. It doesn't feel easier coming into it the second time.
Kind of surrounded by videos and you know, photos and all that of people doing really hard white water but um, one of the big things to remember is that that's not really what it's about I mean I've said it myself it's good to challenge yourself and it's good to get scared every now and then but at the same time it's really good to just go out and paddle a river that you know you can do and that you know that you feel comfortable on um, because you know, that that's how you'll improve is, is practicing what you already do and not being scared because as soon as you get the anxiety levels up too high your skills um, severely diminish. It doesn't need to be a goal when you start kayaking, it wasn't for me. When I did my first course I was like, I don't know if I'll ever get off class two but I'm going to have a go anyway and then ended up paddling on class two enough to get bored on class two and then you're like, sweet. I'm ready for class three and, you, and, and it goes on. I never thought I'd paddle class five um, and I do every now and then. Kayakers live in an interesting world of perceived risk. Uh, this is my second time ever. First time was three years ago. So I really don't know what I'm doing. But I'll give it a nudge. Hope for the best, you know? Anybody who spends 10, 15, 20 seconds upside down not breathing has a story to tell for a lifetime because in that period of time, in theory, your whole life flashed by and a major drama occurred and when they finally either you roll up or you swim and boy, you have a story to tell in the pub. So there's a perceived risk in kayaking, perceived. And that risk, that adventure for a complete beginner, in theory, they're having an adventure on class one or they're having an adventure on flat water when they're upside down. Right now we have 12 people having an adventure in the swimming pool. At any given moment now, some of them aren't breathing. I think some gentle dragging is going to be good. Um, and then quickly followed by fast dragging, and then followed by changing in directions dragging, and then probably yeah, probably hoping to get at least a 50% swim rate in the, in the pool.
now and I'm starting to paddle stuff that's a lot less demanding than it was when I was only 50 something but I still enjoy you know coming around the bend of a river and looking down and seeing a horizon line and hearing noise and seeing white water splashing in the distance it is something that you can do for the whole of life the white water paddling I started when I was in my late 30s and, uh, and now I'm in my early 70s. <laughs> so I just got to keep going while I can. <laughs> you have to be sensible about your old age. You, you biologically you deteriorate, and I don't want to be out there where I'm A, not enjoying what I used to enjoy, also I don't want to endanger my friends. I really can't paddle what I used to paddle, and, and, and that's going to get worse until it stops. And that's kind of hard to take, so. One of the reasons I don't kayak as much as I used to. When I was only about 50, I, I got a thrill out of kayaking hard water and I got off on it, I mean, in a buzz from it and I felt I'd achieved something and I was buzzed the next day. And Now, I, I remember we did a grade five run last year and I fell out in the middle of it and I got a pounding and I thought I was gonna die and I thought, no, I'm not enjoying that. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a natural biology that when you get old, Nature's genes and things are telling you to stop being a damn fool. And there's nothing worse than an old person trying to look like a young person. It's undignified. And I really enjoy this when I don't have to worry so much about whether I roll or not. I love the feel of kayaking. But I also now, on a river like this where we're going for two days, I'm quite happy to go on a cataract and just sit there and look at the scenery and not worry too much about whether I can manage a rapid or not. But really, I find now when I get into a kayak, I'm, I'm not as good as I used to be, and it's not just a little difference, it's a big difference, and it's just hard, you know? It's really, it's like you used to be able to play the piano, and now you can't play, you only can play chopsticks. 
it, you lose your enjoyment of something. So this allows me to um, get down the river and do all the stuff I want to do and, and be in the river and be with people that I like and, uh, and places that I like. What is the magic synergistic relationship between kayaking and beer? It's, it's really weird, isn't it? It's pretty simple. Kayaking makes you thirsty. <laughs> This is just cruel. <laughs> I'm going back into my hole. I really love journey trips. It doesn't have to be a hard river, it's just getting out on the river with people who are keen. You know, they say the best boat is the person having the most fun, and often that is someone who's, you know, doing their first overnight trip or doing, you know, a class two river that they've never done before. So I just love being on the water with keen people. Kayaking, in particular, as opposed to tennis, you know, or golf. Golf, you build your skills to get perfection. In kayaking, you do it so you don't frighten yourself to death and you can take on bigger challenges. It's quite different. And I, that appeals to me. Golf doesn't appeal to me. Um, achieving perfection is nice. I like golf, but kayaking just kills golf. <laughs> it's just much better. not knocking safety but I think you do it's a bit like kids now you know they're not allowed to climb trees and they're not allowed to have playgrounds with things you climb on they might fall over and bang themselves I don't know how many kids grow up now without having broken a bone but when I was a kid everybody broke something <laughs> I mean I'm not saying I recommend it it's just that um, somewhere along the line you, you need to be able to give people um, the ability to go out and test themselves and I see kayaking in that light it gives you a whole lot of skills you can take into real life as well. So it gives you confidence, it gives you leadership skills, it gives you, pro it gives you problem solving, um, it gives you the ability to make assessment of risk. I need, and I think we need, male, female, young, middle-aged or old, we need some physical challenges and the great thing about kayaking is that there's a serious physical challenge and the way you overcome it is by investing your time in learning how to do it properly. People need to go into the wilderness. As humans, we need it. I think too often people get bubble wrapped. They live in a little world of bubble wrap. There is risk in our lives. Part of being a human is being able to take that risk, make an analysis of it, and then make the right decision. When you're kayaking, you're doing it constantly. You're always making assessments of risk. I could die on a river, but I guess as being a kayaker, you understand that and you take all the means necessary to try and avoid that happening, but it's always gonna be, it's always gonna be out there. You can't get rid of it. Managed risk is mostly about the decision-making process, weighing up your level of skill, your level of confidence with any objective danger with the team you've got around you. Does it move you when it starts to groove you? Does it soothe you in your soul? I think a high point of the day for me was scouting the last rapid with Courtney, having her tell me the lines. <laughs> that was a really good change, you know. Just a few years ago, she was following me like a little duck down the rapids and now she's showing me. It was a, a really neat role reversal.
My paddling relationship with Courtney is uh, I was a school teacher a few years back. I used to hate the water, I couldn't stand it, I didn't even like going to a swimming pool to go swimming. Um, and then yeah, I got into it because my folks made me start up a water sport and so yeah, I did kayaking with Aiden and now I, you can't keep me out of the water. He's always been right behind me the whole way, super supportive and now it's just great to go out with him as a bait, go out on a hard river together and we're both sorting out our lines instead of him just telling me where I should be going, where I shouldn't be going, um, what strokes I should be taking. She's got so much potential and so much enthusiasm and so much drive to stay on the water as long as she can and paddle that she can, she can take it as far as she wants. There's not many people who are, whose only limit is their imagination, I think. And then in left backstroke, chin on the toes. Yeah. Am I doing a backstroke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Backstroke and, and like right lean forward. Nose, so yeah. forward. Yeah. Yeah. Through 11, do you want Alex to backstroke through? Um, 15, 16, 17, where you have White Horse Rapids. Fighting upstream, a Swiss visitor, Peter Moser, demonstrates aspects of Europe's latest sport, canoe slalom racing. Get to the right spot, swing out into the current, and then all you have to do is keep inside the wire slung gate. Peter Moser has won third place in Swiss canoe slalom championships. For the reverse gate, you fight upstream, slide through backwards, and lose points if, like that, you touch a gate with the paddle. In the White Horse Rapids, most people try to stick to the deepest channel, but Moser shows how to dodge between boulders and pass through the gates. His skill and his folding 14-footer introduce an exciting sport which should soon become well acclimatized. So, surfing. Surfing. It's gonna be good. Gonna be Pretty good. excited. You nervous? A little bit. But uh, more excited than nervous, which is good. Is it kind of a, um, a ratio of excitement to nervousness that uh, you keep one like... Uh, yeah, once you tap that ratio, it's all over. So I think it's one of those ones where it's like, either it works or it doesn't, and it does it very quickly.
was awesome. It was, it was probably only about three seconds, but it was just like, it was a super fun three seconds. There were a lot of rappers that were cattle in those days. Um, and we always had a special run before a dam was flooded. The last run through, through Wakahiki, we tackled that uh, initially with the big rubber dinghies, the big 12-foot rubber dinghies. And we made sure they all had their wheels made before we took them through and got a jolly good movie out of it. It was screening in London, the most exciting film they'd made for the week. At Mihi, on the Waikato River, where an old Maori dugout canoe is still in commission, canoeists prepare for a weekend voyage. Outside the meeting house, preparations are made. Modern kayaks assembled and their skins tightened, war surplus rubber dinghies inflated. People from the city bring a half hour of activity. But most days of the week, life here has the steady flow of the broad, deep river. The local dugout goes upstream for the fishing. With the others, members of the New Zealand Canoe Association go downstream to explore rapids where no canoes have been before. For the first mile or so, the current is good, the surface smooth. The rubber dinghies come into the first rapids. Now the kayaks put their prows into the waves. Once you're over the lip, nothing can stop you. From the canoeist's viewpoint near the water, it's hard to see what's ahead. Next kayak comes over the lip. It's rough riding and a bit damp, but not so difficult as it looks. Away he goes, down towards the curving tail race of the rapid. Now the dinghies, one going right down an overfall. No need to pick the smoothest route with these rubber monsters. They're all buoyancy and nothing but buoyancy. Here's another one picking the toughest route. And now going down the tail race, ambling along as gracefully as a cow through a swamp. Further downstream, the river comes into thermal areas where geysers and hot springs pattern the banks. It's evening now. In the morning, the crews inspect the sites of Oraki Karako, including the great white silica terraces in their steaming surroundings. At Oraki Karako, the river flows between thermally active banks. Further downstream, the going is too rough for canoes, so only the rubber dinghies set off. The Fokkaheke Rapids, never navigated as yet by craft of any kind. Here is the greatest danger point, with large rocks obstructing the flow and throwing up turbulent waves. They've passed the worst rock and they're safe. No, they're not safe, they're over. Yes, they're over and no one can help them. If they can keep from hitting rocks, they should be all right. Here they come, two holding on, two getting full value out of their life jackets. As the 36-foot drop of the Fokkaheke Rapids still hasn't been navigated, another crew has a try. They're being pulled towards the rock. Quick, get that sweep over the stern and straighten her up. That's better, and just in time to go over the lip in good order. Now for the place where the first one up ended. They've made it. No, don't speak too soon.
Yes, they've made it. So that was it. A quiet weekend spent pioneering rapids on the Waikato River. This evening we'll all go back from the country to the hazards and excitements of Auckland City. The single thing about kayaking is if you do enough of it, eventually you get humble because the river deals to you. And at that point, it swaps from being an individual sport to a team event. It suddenly dawns on you, despite your best effort and all the training and the testosterone, that you actually do need other people to get you out of that river. So you're looking for your friends. So it's an intense individual sport, but if you Make a mess of it, you need friends. <laughs> Why do we do these things? I signed up, I clicked the $50, went into somebody's account and now I'm here. First time. I don't even like the look of this ramp here. Sorry, if I'm running out of adrenaline. <sighs> Dry. Okay, I'm gonna give it a crack. Yeah. Let's do it. You get it out first and I'll follow you. Right, I'll be behind by about 10 boat lengths, I reckon. Okay, so we're going to the left of that rock. Yep. You're gonna to wanna to drive super, super, super hard. Super hard, right? right? Yeah. So the we don't accidentally end up left. The other slower option is to go to the right of that rock and kind of bumble your way around. Left, right. Shit, I should have written it on my hands. Oh. Okie dokie. See how there is a bit of an eddy behind that? The first rock? Yeah. You mean the hole? But it's not an eddy, it's a hole. Nah. We could just sit up here all day and just watch. It's a good spot. Good viewing platform. Yeah. 
I'll try waving the eddy on the right there for you. If I get smashed, um, what eddy? This one here? Oh no, it's further down. Below the first bit. I think I'm gonna cry. Oh my god, is my bung plug done up? Is my bottom clip done? Body check! Paddle a kayak or canoe, no. friend. I'm talking just to you. No. Let's get together by the river at the old footing. And by the time we're taken out, you'll know just what I'm talking about. That old class five white water adrenaline. The citron race is a strange animal, but I like it. It's challenging and quite scary and big. And you're doing it with three other people breathing down your neck, which makes that narrow entrance really exciting. I've been to Citroen Race twice now. Um, both times, even driving down there, I'm like, why? Why am I doing this? I already know that the rapid scares me. I already know that I'm going to get beatings. Um, but I do it anyway. Last year in the final, I like went left and got messed around a bit, but I, I didn't get stuck in the eddy, so. That was, yeah, I was lucky, I guess. Every year, you get on that ramp and you're like, okay, this is it. Just try not to swim. The place to find it's on the river. Adrenaline's gonna keep me there for sure. Go! Fun is the word I would use. Sort of a self-flagellating kind of fun. There's a little bit of that NASCAR aspect. You want to see people wreck, but you don't want to be that one who wrecks. Really nervous. Really nervous. What are you nervous about? Um, getting back looped and all the rest of it. Try not to swim is really staying alive. It's going to be fun. It's going to be good. I tried to go left and I uh, messed it up, had a roll, and then just dropped into that massive hole. Got ripped straight out of my boat and oh, hurt my leg a little bit. So hopefully it'll, uh, it won't be too bad and I can carry on. Too bad I, I can't find the rest of it swept downstream. But the plate broke off as I was trying to roll. I ended up swimming and had a bit of downtime, but uh, I'm okay. This is only a paddle and it's a beautiful day, still alive. There must be just some little dark creature inside us because that walk up is the hardest part of the day and you do it over and over again. And by the last run of the day you're really tired and you've still got to be fast and you've still got to be precise. I think it's all of those things that make it seem horrible. Make it good.
days here I'm so long gone We had people go under logs, um, people get divorced, I can remember one divorce. A divorce? Um, a divorce, yeah. yes, so they're a huge domestic up, up there. And we should have laughed, but that is, is quite it, funny. Well, yeah. it's typical, it's, it's the, the, the almost predictable one of a guy taking a very reluctant girlfriend, or in this case his wife, kayaking, when she didn't like water. And he just persisted. You've seen it before, right? Oh, yes. Except this one went to nuclear proportions. I think she would have been a better kayaker than him, but she dumped him. Here, in this river. If, if something is stretching to breaking point, this is the kind of place where it'll either cement it together really strongly or it'll break it completely. I mean, there really isn't much in between. It's pretty binary. It feels a bit like dancing to me. I can't dance on land for to save my life, but um, on the water it seems to just all come together. I'm working on getting better at it. All the rocks that you miss by millimetres. And then there's the illusion, the one you're always struggling with. Have you never worked it out? Well, at the beginning of the season, you're trying to make the moves in high water, and it's really hard. But as the season goes on, you get better and better, and finally you're a superstar. Of course, and then it rains, and the river comes back up again, and you're as crap as you always were.
reality check. And then you realize that you're just a flea on the planet. <laughs> and all you're doing is a pathetic... Well, I, I, don't, I think proportionally we're less than a flea. Oh, really? Less well, yeah. Look at it, we're a flea on a flea on the planet. Which puts our pathetic attempts at mastering nature here in context. Yeah. <laughs> Me trying to get a millimetre closer to the same rock I've been trying to get near next to for 20 years. The whole futility of human existence. Well, now you're getting Typified a... in one missed move. Now you're getting a bit nihilistic. OK, are you back to my only <laughs> rationale for doing any of this stuff? It's just because it's fun. That's it. Fun. Kayaking is fun. No? Good. Let's keep it simple, loving, deep, meaningful. All right. Uh, I may need some help. Oh. <laughs> I feel like a sheep stuck on its back. Try that. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Not ready. Get it. Win. <laughs> Looking icebergs. Huge. Oh, I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no to coming back to the Mount Cook area. Great place. Great place to pedal, great place to get married, great place to rock climb, you know, it's got everything. It's a one-stop shop. Didn't know this was here. This little gym that we're about to pedal for the first time. Alrighty, ready? Okay. 
It's all you. There's a couple of options. I think the safest, use the little micro eddy on the sort of river left over there just to slow you down, to line up a narrow slot, get right up on the angled rock to avoid the pinning rock below it and just slide down through the slot. Yeah, you want to make sure you get the slot straight though. If all goes to plan, it's tempting. The longer I look at it, the more tempting it is. But uh, the sensible part of me says I'll walk around. Yeah, the dad in me says I'll walk around. I definitely wouldn't mind that if I do die, die doing something I love. That's the way I want to die for sure, but if I can prevent it, I probably should. And really looking forward to tomorrow. Oh, it's tempting though. It's so tempting. There are people who would run there, and I'm almost one of them. Come oh, on, son. There you go. paddling hard stuff you know that there's a chance that things will go wrong. We're just looking at the lines here and there's definitely some lines. Um, they're a little bit risky at this point of the day considering how tired and dehydrated we are. <laughs> um, so we're just thinking about the consequences and the potential hazards of running it versus walking it. Um, both ways are dangerous enough. <laughs> but yeah we're, we're having a good look. We've seen lines through the top part. They're not the nicest, but then we get down to here and there's no real eddies above here. And I've never really had a bad swim. This was my first bad swim. Uh, and so I've always known that it was that it was something that could happen. You go into the river knowing that it could be, you know, it could be, it could be today, it could not be, but you put yourself with a good crew and 
yeah, they'll do, you know, they'll do their best to save you as much as I would do my best to save them. So, at the end of the day, I'm sitting here telling you the story. Courtney Kieran. Can't say thanks to that girl enough. <laughs> Amazing lady. Pulled me to where I need to be. I was kicking like there was no tomorrow. And um, she got me to where I needed to be and I swam the rest. <laughs> I've never done this before and I don't ever want to do it again. I don't want anyone to ever have to do that. It's not fun. It's not fun. It's terrifying. Yeah. Scariest thing I've ever done in my whole life, swimming down that. Easily, without a doubt. The river's always in charge and I definitely learned that today. Yeah. I'm bloody <laughs> glad none of them trapped you. Well that's why I, all I all I was thinking about was feed up, bum up, get a breath when you can. That's all I was doing. I'm so glad you know where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> to describe in one word, exhilarating. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. It, it was it was a fun trip with a happy ending. Which you know, we all like. That's quite a majestic photo of uh, Aiden, just, just so you know. <laughs> like kayaking has given me very skinny legs that don't work very well, sore shoulders and oversized back, but a collection of memories, some mental resilience, the ability to make decisions, the ability to get along with people who you've just met, so many other intangible things, it's worth all that and more. For most people it's a completely new skill, a completely new set of skills and you start off having no idea what a wave in the hole is and what an eddy is and it's almost like an initiation, getting through all that stuff. There are some sports that completely hold your attention. There's a certain pleasure in cruising around in a kayak. I've never lost it. Some days you feel like an absolute superhero and you can get down anything. Other days you're kayaking like a bumbling idiot and you know, it's just not working for you. It is one of those experiences that you just never master. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of the appeal, knowing that no matter how hard you try, like always learning new things, you're never going to be the best. There's always going to be something else to learn, a new challenge. You can never overcome the sport. When I first started kayaking, a river to me was nothing more than somewhere that had a good swimming hole. Yeah, now I look at rivers with a whole new perspective. We'll be tramping and you'll see, you'll see a tiny little creek and you couldn't even get a boat in it. But, you know, you can see the line. You can see the line if you were tiny, if you're an ant and you could go kayaking, there's a line. The human body is not meant to go to the grave polished. It's meant to be battered, leaking, broken, held together with duct tape. I don't want to coast to my death. I want to scream sideways, <laughs> churning up dust, <laughs> now with a battered vehicle, knowing that I've milked every bit of life out of it I can, you know?
drinking tomorrow Just you wait and see Go out and get me a kick-ass job And she'll come back to me She'll come back to me, boys She'll come back to me Go out and get me a kick-ass job And she'll come back to me Last words? I love you, Mum and Dad. And my brothers and sisters. I'm sorry for being so stupid. Should have kept me in school. She's gone. Bye, Soph. Oh, she's fucking up. Oh, shit balls. Oh, this is really inspiring confidence. Oh, goodbye, Soph. She'll probably chase after her. No, and the crowd's cheering. That's never good. She's out. I can't do this. I hope you're going to edit this footage as in, like, get rid of it completely. You can see this in the middle part there, like that. You might have to push me, Bill. I'm not going to get off here myself. Just push me. Someone want to give Spanner a push? <laughs> Uh, here we go. Push. Yep. Just a, a nice one. You really want one. Yep. Go for it. All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We might have some action up the top here. Someone's going back in the hole. This isn't a good look. Um, and I want to do a personal apology, actually, um, to Spanner, because I told her the wrong line. We got some people um, and down there. I figured that out as soon as I dropped in there and went for it and was like, well, this isn't actually where I went last year. I told her wrong. And then my personal, probably six rolls later, when I was at the very bottom of the rapid, having not caught the rapid halfway, um, realised my faux pas and um, also realised that she was probably dropping in doing what I'd told her to do and getting the beating of her life, um, which turns out to be true. So sorry, Spanner. I've a life that's full, everyone's been good to me. So fire up that fiddle, boy, and give me one last drink. When the sun comes up, I will leave without a fight. The world is mine tonight.
I was looking for something fun to do, so I thought I'd buy me a canoe. The store had one second hand, not too beat up for half a grand. I said, I'll take it. Started writing a check. The man said, hold on, son, you still need accessories. So he sold me airbags, dry bags too, a PFD and a paddle or two, a throw rope helmet and rescue knife, some river maps, I was set for life, I was ready for white water with no money left to get there. So I joined a canoe club and went to their school, all decked out, was I ever cool. We spent the first day on a lake, I thought this canoeing's a piece of cake. I knew a J-stroke, I knew a low brace, I wish I'd have known what was a coming. Down at the put-in, the other folks were practicing their paddling strokes. They ferried river left and right while I just drifted out of sight. Down the river, going backwards. Heard the roar, my first rapids. When I finally got turned around, I wasn't thrilled with what I found. Was headed for a rock dern when someone shouted, Eddie Turn. My name wasn't Eddie. So I didn't turn, I just got pinned up against that rock. We got to our first class three drop, scouted it, watched others flop. My heart was beating like a drum, Niagara Falls, here I come. I found the chute, perfect entry, forgot how to brace but not how to swim. I was about half starved when we stopped for lunch, right beside a scraggly bunch of local folks who were camped out near. Their necks were red and they sure liked beer. They looked at us funny and they looked real mean. I wish I'd never seen Deliverance. We finally reached the takeout place. My knees were sore and my head sure ached. My clothes were soaked and my lips were blue. Had new dance in my old canoe. I crawled out of my boat. Someone said, how about next week? I just grinned and said, why not? I was looking for something fun to do, so I thought I'd buy me a canoe.